Good afternoon, this is a committee on taxation. We're here for a work session on one bill. I'm Senator Dana Dow representing most of Lincoln County along with the towns of Windsor and Washington. And my co-chair. Good afternoon. Sorry about the late start. My name is Ryan Tipping. I represent House District 123, most of the wonderful people of Orono. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Stanley. I represent District 143 with East Monarch and Monarch and Medway, Patton, and a small part of the unorganized territory. Hello, I'm Gary Hilliard, House 76, the towns of Belgrade, Mount Vernon, Vianna, Fayette, and Wayne. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Tepler. I represent House District Number 54, which is all of the community of Topsom. Good afternoon. I'm Mo Terry. I represent District 26, West Gorham. Good afternoon. I'm Janice Cooper. I represent uh, House District Number 47, which is Yarmouth, Long Island, and Shabig. Good afternoon. Matt Pugliot. I represent House District 86. And uh, for those BIW employees in the room, my father has worked at the shipyard since I was in diapers. He's not employed by BIW, though, uh, in full disclosure. And just want to say thank you for the great ships that you built. Thank you. Um, I'm Gay Grant. I represent Gardner and Farmingdale in the house. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon. I'm Justin Chenette, and I represent Senate District 31, which includes the communities of Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Lemington, and Buxton. Our clerk is <coughs> Doris Dubord and uh, Diane. Diane. I did it again, didn't That's okay. I? Last week I was the deep, so I'll answer to anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was Dolores last week. That's right. <laughs> yeah, was Doris. The doctor says, my wife said I needed new glasses. Uh, and our analyst is Julie Jones. Uh, just a few ground rules before we get started. This is a work session, so there'll be no uh, public testimony. Uh, we'll keep the uh, oohs and the ahs to a, a, a very minimum. I'll just tell you this little story first. This is the way I'd like to run the, the meeting in here today. I had, I taught school, I taught chemistry and physics, and I had a class, and I showed at the beginning of the year, and I showed one of the other teachers in the school the class list for this one particular class, and they were horrified because I had all, I had all the bad actors in the same class at the same time. But it ended up to be one of the best classes I ever had. We got along great. We got along so good that they even made a sign for me that said quiet day. Because when they could tell I was having a bad day, one of them brought the sign up front, put the sign up, and they acted like angels, literally. So that's the way I want this meeting to go. <laughs> because I'm still a school teacher. And uh, we'll turn it over to Julie. We're going to go over the new language that's been brought to us. Yes, this is, it, this will get a little confusing as you look through your files because you're starting to get a variety of documents handed out to you at various points. The one that we're talking about today is the one that was on your desk dated 3-6 um, and has my initials on it. What it does is incorporate changes made by Maine Revenue Services um, into an earlier draft that you reviewed. And I'm going to ask if Heather Popadak from Maine Revenue Services could come down and explain. The yellow language, the yellow highlighted things in here are changes that were made to the previous draft. 
um, based upon Maine Revenue Service's technical concerns. And um, the gray highlighted language is sort of my adjustment to some of that based upon um, what I thought may have been some previous misunderstanding. The intent was to try to put together, and you haven't voted on this bill yet, so we don't really know where all of you are as individuals, but at the last work session you were kind of talking about a consensus of ideas that you wanted us to draft, um, one of which was to increase the numbers of employees required for the credit and therefore also in the acceleration and deceleration um, sections by increasing those levels of employment 500 each time the number of employees is mentioned. The original bill had, or draft had said 5,000 employees for, um, I guess it was the, the, the draft that had the two levels of, um, of investment, the, the two tiers of credits one for 10 years and another for the next 10 years. And it had provided, the original one had provided 5,000 for the first 10 years and 4,000 for the second 10 years. But we understood your request at the last work session to be to increase those numbers by 500 employees each um, on, with the concept that 5,500 5, was close to the slightly less than the current level employee, current level of employment that the folks from Bath Ironworks told you at the last work session. Um, I think, I don't think there's anything in here particular, well, I should ask Heather to come down. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe I can start to walk you through it and maybe, um, at some point, I may have to I may have to lean on Heather to explain why things are done. But basically, the yellow, like I said, are changes um, that um, are provided for your consideration to deal with Maine Revenue Services technical issues. The first uh, section, new section in the bill, yellow at the beginning, adds in two sections into the uh, Maine Revenue Services disclosure language to permit them to disclose information to this committee with regard to the credit um, uh, and information to DECD with regard to the credit that would be necessary for administration of the credit. Um, the sections in the definition, um, and they've added in tax year rather than just a year for their administrative purposes. Um, they spelled out the word six, there's not a change there. It, the number six was in the draft, but um, I, at the, the drafting manual uh, requirements say that all numbers are expressed as numerals rather than words, uh, unless it's the number one or unless it's the first word of a sentence. So those should be number sixes, not word sixes. Um, at the bottom of the page, exception year, it includes that increase in employment <coughs> that was mentioned. It was, it, was, um, it was indicated at the last work session that there was, that although the, the legislation refers to full-time employees, there was not a definition of what full-time means. Uh, a, a, a definition is proposed in here which says an average of at least 36 hours weekly. Um, that was, I think, borrowed from the headquarters credit bill. Um, and um, although I understand that uh, Bath Ironworks may have some concern with that definition, but that's where that figure came from. Uh, main ship building facility, I'm not sure why that's yellow. Is this a new one? Okay, so that's a new definition. Oh, okay, yes. The, the bill just defined the word facility because this draft uses the term main ship building facility. It's um, Change to that and enhanced a little bit, I guess. Um, took out the need that it had to be for. Oh, no, speak. Uh, it also took out the need that it had to be for uh, military vessels or, or naval vessels. It could also be for non military. <coughs> um, 
just start I don't know what you're doing with this one. I don't own an operator. The owns and operates uh, a little bit later in the document. There was a place, uh, I think it was owns slash operates. Uh, it's probably just cleaner to have owns and operates rather than say have a holding company own something and then another company uh, operating it. This can be changed if, if you want, but it just was a little clearer with owns and operates. Why don't you just keep going? Okay. Uh, again, the number is 5,500 to reflect the committee's expression earlier. Uh, qualified employee means an individual. That head said that means a person, uh, but in Title 36, person is defined as many things, including uh, partnerships, corporations, trusts, estates, clubs, etc. So we changed that to individual. Uh, working at a main shipbuilding facility owned and operated by that applicant is to specify this is for main jobs and main facilities uh, whose income is derived from employment with main shipbuilding facility I believe that was your suggestion um, I, well I think there was in mean, the language it's it said without the yellow language just whose income calculated on a calendar year is greater than the average annual per capita income in the state and the yellow language was added in to clarify that this is whose income derived from employment with the main shipbuilding facility because someone who's employed by the main shipbuilding facility may have income from other sources but the idea is that the the income from their shipbuilding job should be greater than the average annual per capita income Representative Tipping. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you so early in going through this. Um, for Section I, uh, Subsection 1, the working at, main ship, uh, at a main shipbuilding facility owned and operated by the applicant. So that would not allow, if the company were to hire um, uh, employees that could do the job out of state, uh, working you know, uh, via computer, drafting, whatever, uh, they, they would not apply to the numbers here, right? They would not count as qualified employees if they were working out of state, even if they were working at a facility out of state owned by the same company. That's my understanding, is that these would be lo jobs located in Maine okay. and sitting here doing that work. Yep. Thank you. On uh, page three, two sub uh, two C, we added more than fifty percent, so that we had a majority instead of just leaving it at fifty percent. This is the this is the transfer language. Uh, this is the transfer language. Sorry, um, under two C on page three. Representative Grant. Thank you. Is it your understanding in this language that? Um, if there is a transfer of the um, uh, business, that the any clawback provisions also are transferred. Do we need specific language for that? I think I think um, we, we need to talk about that. But is it your assumption that that's already included? Um, on further review of this draft in more detail over the weekend it occurred to me that clawback or recapture is not really applicable in the case of this draft the way it currently exists what it provides is that um, um, where's the revocation language the Page 5, subsection 7, provides uh, that a certificate of approval uh, must be revoked by the commissioner of DECD if the certified applicant has not made qualified investments of at least $100 million within five years after issuance of the certificate. <clears throat> so they can get a certificate by proposing to make a $100 million investment. But if they don't make that investment by the fifth year, their certificate of approval must be revoked. But when you look at the credit language in subsection 3 on page 4, the credit is only available um, 
beginning with the tax year that the certified applicant has made qualified investments of at least $100 million or the tax year beginning on or after January 1, 2020, whichever is later. So they're not going to get a credit until they have invested $100 million. They won't be eligible for one. So since the certificate can't be revoked until five years and they haven't invested $100 million, there'd be nothing to recapture because they wouldn't have gotten a credit unless they had invested the $100 million. Representative Grant. Except that if um, they also don't meet the um, employment levels that we've established, um, let's say, I'm just saying as a hypothetical, if there was a situation in which um, there was a recapture provision invoked and the, the current owner was in a situation where they owed MRS clawbacks, if you will, would that liability also translate to a new owner without language that specifies that? This bill does not pro provide for any revocation of the certificate or any recapture of credits with regard to numbers of employees. It's only with regard to whether they've invested the $100 million. So you would need to add language if you wanted to, to provide that. In, in that case, you would need um, some recapture language if that's what you wanted to provide. Um, and and I, I know your concern was whether, in the case of when the credit was transferred, who would be responsible for making the payment, the recaptured payments in, in the event that recapture should happen, um, and that would need to be clarified. The, the language that was in the original bill was, I assume, copied out of the existing benefit statute, and the existing benefit statute does permit the shipbuilder to get a benefit before they have invested the required amount. So that's why it was applicable in that situation. But with the way this one is designed, it wouldn't be applicable. Um, there wouldn't be an opportunity for recapture under this one. Yeah, we'll continue on here. Yeah. Oh, Representative Tepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I have some concerns, a little Harper and still around the transferability section. Um, and um, having spoken with some folks, we talked about the possibility of some kind of a determination of eligibility for transfer um, beyond um, simply uh, the commissioner's um, say so. Um, so uh, I guess I would I would like to think about a little bit about whether there's some language we could add that would create some kind of determination of eligibility. Yeah. That's perfect timing. <laughs> On the next section, uh, there's a unitary word unitary we've added to added to the sub one sub two. Um, and so to give some background, and if this did not have the word unitary there, it did have the word affiliated group there. An affiliated group is a group that uh, there might be, say, a parent, and there may be several sub-companies, which may have its own sub-companies, um, and they may all be affiliated. They may not be doing the same business. They may be doing... Uh, you could have a shipyard and a blueberry field and a, you know something else going on, and they're not they're affiliated in that they have the same common lineage or, or similar, but they don't they're not in business forming a, a product together, a unitary. So on section two, where we put the unitary in, if these folks are all in the business of making ships together, they you know, steel company, and they're working with the marine supply, with the piping, et cetera. They're all putting this ship together in a unitary. They're filing a combined return. If this, if they're not part of a unitary group, it's going to be need a more thorough review that the commissioner is going to need to say, what are your intentions? Are you going to continue operations as a shipbuilding facility, et cetera? On number one, it's more of a free pass. You guys are all a unitary. You're filing a combined return. You are... Uh, you're all in this together. 
making this product or whatever, and, and that's a general idea of what Unitary is. They have a more vested interest in continuing the shipbuilding facility. And that's why we added the word Unitary. So, so the way this is drafted, in order to approve the transfer, the commissioner would need to um, determine that if they were part of a unitary group, either that they are a member of a, of a unitary affiliated group, or if they're not, that the uh, transferee intends to continue the operations of the main shipbuilding facility in substantially the same manner as prior to the transfer and has the financial capability to do so. If you wanted to add more language, more additional requirements in there, that would be the place to do that. So you could do that if you want to. Um, it's up to whatever you want to do. Um, I think I would because I'm not sure that um, that the we don't know um, what will be happening with the ECD some years from now, and um, it's unclear to me from this language that the commissioner actually has any responsibility to anyone in the legislature um, to report the eligibility um, of a particular facility. Uh, and since this is a legislative um, effort, I think I would like to see some kind of language in there requiring the commissioner perhaps to report to this committee about um, the transfer of eligibility or, or some kind of, of similar uh, reporting requirement. Does that make sense to the committee? So if I'm understanding correctly, you're not necessarily proposing that there be a change in the eligibility requirements, but in a requirement that the, that the commissioner report to the legislature um, the standards by which he has or she has determined that the transfer meets the requirements specified here. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I think you are, Julie. I think that that simply requiring that this information goes somewhere other than within DECD itself um, is helpful for transparency and accountability. Yeah. Continue on. On page four, three, A and B, and it kind of dovetail. Um, we just changed the wording so the credit works properly. Uh, the what could happen is the entire investment could be made in 2018 because the investment starts January 1st of 2018, and the other language had in the tax year following the calendar year in which the investment was completed, and yet it also clearly stated that the credit was not allowed before January 1st, 2020. Had the entire investment been made in 2018, uh, there would have been a problem, there would have been ambiguity as to the credit in 2019. Would they miss out on a year? Would they double count the next year? That didn't wasn't allowed in the language, so in order to not miss out on a year of the credit, uh, we changed the wording up to take care of that issue. Also on page four, limitations is sub four. Um, and I think we just tighten the language on A. B, again, uh, we change calendar year to tax year because not everybody has a calendar year tax year. Um, then, and the numbers are as reflected in the 500 increments. 4C is uh, it's ex anybody who is certified for the Pine Tree Development Zone. Uh, receive a certificate of approval. They would not be allowed to take um, this credit. If they received a credit for, or if they received a credit for ETIF, they would not be able to take a credit under this section, which goes to the question that we asked earlier as to whether Pine Tree and ETIF was to be allowed overlap with this credit. Mr. Chair. Representative Tipping. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for adding that provision. Uh, does that so the way I read that, it says they may not 
uh, receive the credit if they already qualify for Pine Tree Development Zone, but um, does this also limit them from applying for that after they've already qualified for this credit? Each tax year they would have to make a choice which okay. credit they would prefer. Okay. <clears throat> but if they are, if they're no longer certified Pine Tree, uh, they would go for the shipbuilding. But they couldn't take a year off uh, the shipbuilding credit if they thought they would get a better deal with ETIF and then go back to the shipbuilding credit, no. correct? I think they could possibly, but again, with ETIF, it's the incremental right. hiring rather than the over accumulative hiring. And okay. so they may not choose to do that. Okay. Uh, D, in that same section on page 4, 4D, uh, just is clarifying the end date of the credit, so there's no ambiguity there. On page 5, sub 5, accelerated credit, uh, again, just clarifying our understanding of what the committee wanted for numbers for employment. Also on page 5, sub 6, decelerated credit, uh, you'll see the number change again, but also we changed the word. At one point it was uh, the credit authorized and then there was a credit due and we changed it to credit allowed. Seven on same on page five still, revocation. And as Julie has already mentioned. I'm sorry, may I jump yep. back? Yep. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to be clear, so if they fall below under this language 4,500, they would receive no credit. They wouldn't stay at that same 50 percent, correct? Well, unless it's an exception year. Okay. And exception year is defined on uh, page one, and it's you get two shots at the exception year in okay. that 20 year time frame. Thank you. Uh, back on page five, seven revocation. This is where um, Julie has explained that in order to even get the certificate of approval, the investment of $100 million has to be made before you get the certificate of approval. <coughs> On sub-8, annual reporting. Oh, did I skip over anything? Sorry. Sorry, I was working on a, my notes version. Um, additional requirements. Um, <clears throat> you'll see that it's gray. That's because on our edition, we had actually moved it over to outside of the MRS role and into the reporting role because um, <clears throat> this is not a requirement to get the credit uh, and so <clears throat> well yes um, the gray changes are changes that I made to uh, the main revenue services one um, and ultimately it's not what I think it's what you all think but if you look at the top of page seven uh, Main Revenue Services had proposed to move that additional requirements language. Their draft did not have it in a subsection 8 on page 5. They moved it over to the reporting requirements, but it's not a reporting requirement. It's a statement that the certified applicant, when awarding contracts and purchasing supplies or subcontracting sub work, must give preference to the greatest extent possible to main workers and businesses. Um, which is not a reporting requirement, it's a requirement. So it seemed to me that it should not have been moved into that reporting section. There are reporting uh, <coughs> requirements with regard to that preference, but the actual statement that they're required to provide that preference, I think should be its own subsection under the credit as it was originally with the eight. So I thought it shouldn't be moved out of there as Maine Revenue Services had proposed. Uh, so that's why I sort of stuck it back over there in eight where it had been originally. Um. Representative Temple. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Julie, there's so there's no reporting requirement around this, so there is no um, way to uh, to sort of assess whether this happened or didn't happen. Well, there 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 is actually reporting requirements. If we get later on, we'll point them out. Is that? Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. Sure we point them out. 
and we're, we're moving into the reporting requirements section now. So at the top of page six, um, I'm not sure why, how that changed. I look at the, we just rearranged the wording, just tighten it up a little bit. It was very, very similar to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that, that language that's in yellow at the top right. of page A is just a reorganization of the language in order to be a little bit clearer. Um, there is um, um, one of the requirements with regard to um, the preference um, <coughs> would be in uh, on page six in the middle, paragraph A, uh, subparagraph three, one of the things that's be required to be reported is the total dollar that was spent on goods and services obtained from businesses with an office in the state from which business operations in the state are managed. So that is our interpretation of what is meant by a main business. Um, and there is also, um, I'm sorry, I didn't. 4B. 4B. Oh, yes, okay. The portion of qualified investments that was spent on goods and services from businesses with an office in the state. There is also um, language on page seven towards the bottom um, in gray um, with regard to the evaluation that one of the performance measures. Um, would include information regarding the procedures for ensuring compliance with the preference requirements under subsection 8. So that would be part of what would be evaluated as well, would be the extent to which uh, the business has uh, complied with those preference requirements. The preference requirements are not something that are, that are a condition of receiving the credit. But they are, it, it is a requirement. If they are receiving the credit, they're required to do this. It doesn't say if they don't do it that they don't get the credit, but it's somewhat ambiguous in that way, I guess. But they are required to do it, and they would be required to report on it, and it would be part of the evaluation process. So those are the gray changes on um, the top of page 7. Under evaluation, again, um, um, what would be subsection 10, um, in terms of providing uh, paragraph A, that the specific public policy objective of the credit provided under this section is to create and retain high quality jobs. High quality is crossed out there, but whether you want to do it that way or whether you want to provide a definition of what high quality constitutes, because there's no definition in here of high quality jobs. Um, so if you wanted to, to do that, that would be another alternative of addressing it. But to provide for evaluation based on high quality jobs, when you're not defining what a high quality job is, there's no way of evaluating it. So, um, and, and at, the, at the end of that paragraph, it, it repeats the same language for some reason. Um, industry in there should not be gray or crossed out. That got crossed out by mistake. That should be, industry should remain, the state should build an industry. But the language that's crossed out would be, again, the language and retain or create high quality shipbuilding jobs, which is at the beginning of paragraphs, that's create and retain high quality jobs in the shipbuilding industry. That's the same, it's the same requirement. Um, and, um, the paragraph J language is just added for to clarify what paragraph uh, that that um, minimum level of expenditure is provided in. Um, I already mentioned the <coughs> information regarding the procedures for ensuring compliance with preference requirements under subsection eight. The um, Language for OKGA providing a report, I yeah, think, is the same as previous language that you looked at. Right. Remember, so maybe we moved, so maybe we, we tightened it up or something. Right. Um, <laughs> the, um, I, 
I've forgotten now who proposed it, whether it's main revenue services or I think it was in an earlier Bath Ironworks draft, that it proposed taking out language in an earlier version that is repeated here in gray that says following receipt of the report, the Jint Standing Committee of the Legislature have left out an O, oh, I'm not a good type of um, that, the, that the taxation committee shall determine whether the credit is meeting its public policy objectives, whether it should be continued, and authorizes the committee to submit a bill. I think um, the company had argued that the committee can already do that. Um, I think it probably can already do that, but this language is requiring a review as opposed to just <coughs> permitting it, or, which I means silence would mean that there would be no requirement that the taxation committee do anything. I think this language was intended, was put in here originally to say that the taxation committee should have to review it in 2024 in order to determine at that point, because that's the sort of point at which you're on the threshold of the second round of $100,000 investment and credit. So the idea was to have an evaluation towards the end of the first round so you could decide whether you wanted to continue the second round. Um, and it seemed like to me like that language ought to still be in there. And I think that we had discussed this, at, or I think that you had discussed this at your previous work session and had decided that you wanted to put that language back in. So that's why that's there. If I misunderstood that, I apologize and just let me know and we can take it out again. Um, and then the summary it just sort of clarifies what other changes are being made. Representative Tippick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Quick question for you, Ms. Popovac. Um, so in here it talks about um, we're asking for information regarding the procedures for ensuring compliance. Right now, for the, the past 20 years, the only measure of compliance has been the report uh, issued by MRS listing uh, job numbers. Um, is there any mechanism that MRS has used to ensure that the job numbers reported were accurate? Or is it just the company gives you the number and the number goes into the report? We don't like to talk about some of our um, verification uh, standards, but we do have um, information okay. that we receive that we can verify. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Senator Chenet. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I want to go back to page five um, in the. Um, I know we had talked about, and I think uh, Representative Grant had asked about um, recapture language um, and the lack thereof. Uh, I guess um, help help to clarify for me the certificate of approval um, can be revo revoked by the commissioner um, if that investment is not made, um, but the lack of a recapture provision means what in terms of what the company receives versus the state government receives in terms of their money back? How, like, well, let's walk out that example of what would actually happen if the commissioner revoked the certificate of approval after a certain point, after they'd already been receiving the tax credit.